we have Marco and Courtney here. They're some of our missionaries that, that we support, and they are going to be sharing with us this morning about their, um, their mission and their mission incentive, what they're doing. So please give it up for Marco and Courtney. Hey, before, before we share about who we are and what God has called us to do, we want to pray for your pastor. Can we do that? Can you, and can you join me? I know he's not here, but I know he's watching. And I, and I think it would be appropriate that we pray for the man and woman of God that leads this beautiful congregation. So w- would you join me right now? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, for Pastor LaVon and, and Sister Brenda, God. I pray, Lord, that your presence would surround them. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to do his work, God. His work is better than our work. And, Father, we just ask in the name of Jesus as you give him vision, as you, as you, as you give him what he needs, Lord, for his family. I pray in Jesus' name that there would be blessing that follows it, oh God. In everything that he does, Lord, for, his, for your kingdom, I pray in Jesus' name that you would minister to him and to his family. I pray, God, that you would give him vision. I pray that you would give him blessing after blessing. And, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for his mom right now. And I pray, Lord, for healing over his mom. God, I thank you for all that you're doing at Evangel Church. And, God, we give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. If you love your pastor, would you put your hands together for, uh, for him and show him how much you love him? Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey, we're the Mahar family. I'm Courtney, and this is Marco. And I think we've got a picture of our little girl, Juliana. She is hanging out with some of your babies in the nursery this morning. So after the service, come by, greet her. She's a little shy, but we'll still try to work on saying hi anyways. Um, But we have been youth pastors in Tallahassee for the last seven years. I grew up originally in Central Florida in the Winter Haven Lakeland area. And my husband grew up as a missionary kid overseas on the continent of Africa in Cameroon and Botswana. Both separately and together, we have a huge heart for missions. And at first we were a little bit resistant because, you know, you want to plant roots somewhere and you want to have a family and you want to have a house and you have this idea of what you want your life to look like. But if it's your idea and it's your plan, it's not God's plan. And so we had to allow the Lord to kind of mess up our lives a little bit and be okay with that. And he called us both separately and together as a family to go to the country of Hungary. So we're going to be working at an international church called Riverside Church Budapest. There's 3% evangelical Christians in Hungary. That's the statistic. So imagine this. Think about... You and 99 of your closest friends, your family, your co-workers, people that you see on a regular basis, and only three of you out of that group of 100 believe in Jesus, you know him, you profess your faith, you go to church, you've been baptized. Just imagine that. That can look like a very scary and dark place to be and to be very lonely but with that 3%, we're believing that it's going to go to 5% and then to 7 and it's going to keep growing because at this church, there are people, and Marco will share a little bit more, but they're seeing an average of about 250 people every single Sunday. They've gone to two services because they need to make room to bring more people in. There's people from all over the world that are coming to Budapest for in search of a better life, for education, whatever the reason may be, but they're finding Jesus too. And I want to share their mission statement with you, and that's this, where we share Christ, serve others, and change the world. We share Christ, serve others, and change the world. That's their mission statement, and now that's going to be our mission statement. But Evangel, that's your mission statement too. Because if he hasn't asked you to go, then he's asked you to stay. And for you to be a light in your world, to share Christ with somebody. Because I bet there's at least one person in Jackson County that doesn't know Jesus. 
And you could be the one to share that with them and to help give them a new life in Jesus' name. So as my wife had said, we, um, this church, 30 nations are represented in this, in this congregation. 30 nations, places like the Middle East, people from the Middle East, people in Asia, Buddha-driven Asia, are coming to Europe to find a better life, to get an education, but they're also finding Jesus through the ministries of Riverside Church. And so we have that opportunity. I love this, though. After eight years of full-time ministry, youth ministry, and seven of those, of those years were in Tallahassee, this church, 80% of them, 80% of this congregation is under the age of 50. They're all young people. They're the next generation that God is raising up. And that's our heart, church. That's our heart, is the next generation so that they may tell their friends, their family about Jesus. And so this is where God has called us to. And so what we would ask of you, our church family, because I know that, that this, when you, when you support missions and when you support mi your missionaries, you become a part of the family. You become a part of our family. We pray for you on a regular basis. I want you to know that through the uh, through Hurricane Michael, we and even before we were uh, we were missionaries, we were praying for you. We were praying for you. We were praying for you guys uh, just several weeks ago when the tornadoes came through. Our hearts are with you, Evangel. Our hearts are with you, and we want you to know that we uh, that we value your prayers more than your giving. Can I say that? We value your prayers more than your giving. And the reason why I, I, uh, why I say that is because this is coming from a missionary kid. There have been times in my life when the enemy was knocking at our door. And God woke up a saint at three in the morning back here at home. Put our family's picture on their heart and on their mind. They woke up and began to pray. And because of those prayers... The enemy was not able to come in. That's why I say we value your prayers more than your giving. It's for protection. But not only for protection, but for sustainability to happen on the field. So thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for giving. And thank you for your, uh, for your prayers. God bless you, Evangel Church. Thank you so much. I think it's only fitting if we pray for him. Amen. Would you stretch your hand out this way? Father, we thank you so much for the calling of, of Marco and Courtney. God, we thank you for the calling that's on their life to serve the kingdom to the ends of the earth. We thank you for their assignment to hungry. God, we pray that as they, as they travel, God, that you just pave the way. God, that you open up doors that no one else can open. Father, we, we are just trusting you in that, Father. We're trusting it, Father, as, as they continue to serve and grow, God, that the mission the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ just flow out of their hearts, out of their minds, God, the way they serve, the way they love, that people see there's a difference. Let light go with them, God. Let there be a noticeable difference. Father, for their family, I pray just protection over them and Juliana. Father, just keep them together, God. I pray that you, you, um, you thwart the enemy's plans, that nothing, nothing that comes against them will prosper. That the gates of hell will not stop the movement in the kingdom of God. We thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. We love you guys. Thank you all so much. Thank you all very much. Make sure and see them out in the foyer. Um, let them know that you love them and pray for them. Uh, what they do is, is commendable. It's very admirable. And to be able to do that, um, that, is, that is a high calling. And I thank you so much for that. I love uh, that Evangel Church has some awesome missionaries that are saying, you know, here am I. Send me. I'm ready. I'll do it. And that's an amazing heart. That's an amazing calling. Amen. Well, we have been in uh, 21 days of prayer for at least 21 days. Um, Pastor uh, was going to be finishing stronger in prayer today. And um, with all the events that are going on, I'm going to finish it this morning for him. So we're going to do stronger in prayer for however many Sundays that we've been in. This is the last one. Unless he changes it, he can do whatever he wants. But I want to talk about prayer. How many of you enjoyed 21 days of prayer? 
How many of you enjoyed 6 a.m.? I didn't think so. Don't you dare lie. This is the house of God. Don't you do that. Um, if you weren't able to join a 6 o'clock prayer, I pray that wherever, wherever you were at, that you had encounters and experiences with God. I would believe that, obviously, God moved beyond 6 a.m. as well. But uh, there was something cool that got to happen every morning here at the church. People would come in, and you saw them, like, they'd have coffee cups that, like, wait till my coffee cup gets down here to say good morning to me. You know what I'm saying? I, I need this much coffee before I can whatever. But we had an amazing time together for 21 days of prayer. And um, through all of this, there's been, there's been things on my prayer list that some have been taken off and then some have been added. And I think there's a reason why we see a verse in Scripture that says pray without ceasing. Why? Because I don't believe life does. Until we draw our last breath, life happens. It happens. There's things that I was praying for and trusting God for that I was able to take off and add to my gratitude list. Thank you, God, for and now, during those 21 days of prayer, I've added more things on to my prayer list. Can we do something? Can we continue in an attitude and an atmosphere of prayer? Can, can we just, just start with that as an umbrella statement? Let that be something we constantly do. Not that we have to mandate, but that what we, stay, what, what we just posture and position our hearts to do is just stay in an atmosphere of prayer. I believe that prayer moves things. I believe prayer changes things. I believe it's modeled, modeled and echoed through Scripture for a reason. But I want to talk about prayer this morning. What is prayer? Prayer is a communication, just as simple as that. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is necessary. How many of you believe communication is necessary? Don't you dare look at your spouse right now. Don't you eyes front. Don't do it. Mm -hmm, your elbow, and this is for you. You better take notes. Here, I brought a notebook for you. Communication is important. Now, there is no certain way, no certain method, no certain lingo that you have to use. You don't have to, to pray in King James. Just have a conversation. God is more concerned about your heart and your posture of prayer than if it sounds good enough or not. I can remember being intimidated. Does anybody, this, this might just be for me. This might be just a healing session for me right now. But anybody ever felt like intimidated to pray in front of a group of people? When you get called on to pray and you're like, all right, how many, I got to use at least three scripture verses. I have to say at least seven names of God. I have, and then they're like, who needs prayer? And then like 50 people raise their hand. And you're like, I have to remember 50 people's prayer requests? Like, I'm going to need a divine intervention of the Holy Spirit to help me with this. I can remember that intimidation in prayer. But I, I have to sound, or I have to say, and then I'm, people are listening, and God's listening, and that's enough pressure. But now you're listening, and I can remember that, that weight. Oh, prayers. But as, I, as I begin to grow and mature in the things of God, I realize, man, it's just a conversation with God. And I see all through Scripture that that's what's important to Him, is that communication. That connection with God. I've heard it before. I forgot who penned it. But a prayer is the umbilical cord to God. It's that constant connection. We laughed at it earlier, but our, our relationships suffer for a lack of communication. Our marriages will suffer. Our, our workplace will suffer for lack of communication. This is going to come to a shock to many of you. But I love to communicate. This is a shock. This is an utter disbelief. I do. It's, I mean, it's, it, ironically, it's kind of a part of my job is to talk, to communicate. So though it's minor, it is a piece. I love to talk. However, after talking all day, sometimes I struggle when I come home to continue to communicate. I.e., there's events that my, me and my wife are supposed to be at that I forgot to tell her until like 3 o'clock that afternoon because I didn't communicate. That, folks, is called tension. <laughs> the communication is important. It's necessary. So I believe when they say verses like pray without ceasing, it's the posture. It's the recognition. Sometimes communication can be nonverbal. It's that connection. You know, you can look at somebody and just like nod or look at them weird, like I know exactly what you said. That's through connection. That's through constant 
communication. Amen? Prayer is the constant source of connection with God. The Bible tells us that God hears us when we pray. Can we stop and just say thank you for that? God hears us when we pray. We see that in, in, through the prophet Jeremiah in, in uh, chapter 29. He's speaking on behalf of God. says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That, that's comforting to me, church. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He says it again in 1 Peter chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. As almost this is how I imagine it. As almost as if he leans his ear in. He's attentive to my prayers. What does that show me? He values that communication. He values it. If God in all his sovereignty sitting on the throne of grace can look at his daughter or son and lean in to what they're saying to him. It shows me he values communication through prayer. It's important to him. I believe it's even more so important that he made us recognize that his own son did it. He modeled it for us. Not because he had to but for our benefit. Look at this. Um, You see it in Luke chapter 5, but Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. Can we challenge challenge us, church? There are some moments where we need to slip away and pray. Uh, That that includes leaving this where we're slipping away from. Just slip, slip away and pray. If 33% of the Trinity saw it valuable, I think we should too. But often... Jesus would slip away to the wilderness to pray. That shows me that. How much more should I? How much more so should I value it enough? I heard this before, and this is liberating and frustrating at the same time. You have time for what you make time for. Priority, right? Is prayer a priority in our life? Today, for the next few moments, I want to go through the Lord's Prayer. Many of you have heard it. Many of you might, might not have. But I want, to, I want to kind of dissect the Lord's Prayer and see it's, because it's something that Jesus is, is praying, right? He says, this then is how you should pray. The disciples are saying, well, then teach us. How, we, how should we pray? And he begins to model it for us. So Matthew chapter 6, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn with me, whether they glow or show, either way. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, says this. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Would you pray? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness. God, thank you for your word that's alive and it's active. God, I pray as your word goes forth today, God, it just, it just, be a, it just, it just become just a, a vessel of life change. God, speak to hearts and lives and, and spirits this morning. Lift up the head of the weary this morning. Comfort those who are mourning or sad or going through life. Father, I pray all this in your heavenly name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. There's a couple of things I want to glean from the Lord's Prayer. Number one, if you're taking notes, if you are um, notes-oriented and you have to have them in a list, number one, know who you are praying to. Our Father in heaven. Prayer is a conversation with God. Okay, we've, we've started that baseline foundational. It's a conversation with God. And every conversation just about begins with addressing to whom you are speaking to. Jesus begins with our Father in heaven. He focuses on a distinct person. He recognizes to whom he's talking to. There's a lot of times that we start in prayer, we say, God, or Jesus, or Holy Spirit, what are we doing? We are calling attention to who we're praying to. Our Father in heaven. We share the same right to call God Father as Jesus does. Isn't that comforting? 
We, we share the same right that we can look to him and say, Father, I need you. I love this. I love this part. Even if the word Father is distorted for you from an earthly perspective, I pray that you find and encounter the Heavenly Father. I'm sorry if you didn't have a good picture of what Father looks like. I'm sorry. I pray that doesn't distract or deter you from knowing your Heavenly Father on that level. That is someone that you can go to. Our Father in heaven. God is in three distinct persons, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and can be called upon. Jesus adds the position of God, our Father in heaven. He speaks of God who resides in heaven and sits with sovereignty. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That the one who has earth is his footstool. Footstool can still lean his ear to my prayer. And sometimes when it don't make sense, Jesus goes ahead and leans in and says, this is what he's saying. He's interceding on my behalf. I've heard this before. I've heard this before. God, I got this. And that means something to me. Our Father in heaven. What I'm calling to the person of God, but I'm also looking at the position of God. I'm putting him in his proper place of sovereignty. God in heaven. Thank you for just who you are in all of your majesty. We recognize the position of God. Number one, know to whom you are praying. Our Father in heaven. Number two, lead with praise. Lead with praise. Hallowed be your name. A heartfelt admiration is a great conversation starter, even in earthly conversations. It's a good way to do it. It's a good way to start. But more importantly, as we take time to praise God for all he has done in the past, the answered prayers, the impossible situations overcome, the healings and the grace that we received, our faith to believe for even greater answer to prayers grows stronger and more confident. Why? When you begin to speak, thank you, God, for what you've done, for who you are, for the times that you showed up. What are you doing? You're building, blocking your faith. You're saying, well, if he, can, if he did it then, he can do it now. If he did it for them, oh, he can do it for me. You are building your faith. You are acknowledging that your praise is opening up the gates of heaven. Hallowed be your name. It's leading with praise. It's leading with that admiration. Notice what is to be hallowed. It's the name. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. There is none greater, no name under heaven given to men that is greater than his. Hallowed be your name. Church, do we recognize that his name is enough? That, that his name is suffice. Even if the prayer is just the name of God, it's enough. Can I, can I show you the power of that? El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai. Lord, my master. Yahweh, Lord, Jehovah. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, is my banner. Jehovah Ra, the Lord, is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, that heals. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord, that is there. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Elohim, God. Jehovah Jireh, the one that provides. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, is my peace. These are the names that we get to say. Why? Because he can't separate his name from his character. They're inseparable. So when you're calling on the name of God, hallowed be your name, you are praying for you are praying in sufficiency. That's it. That's all you need. That is powerful, church. There is no name on heaven or no name on earth that powerful. And currently there's like 7 billion of them. That's a lot of names. And none of them carries that kind of weight. His name means something. Hallowed be your name. And the more that we understand the character of God and who he is, the more we understand the importance of hallowed. 
holy is your name, God. Worthy are you of our praise, of our, our worship. God, before I even ask you of anything, you need to know how much I just love who you are and what you've already done for my life. If you don't do another thing, what you've done is already enough. That's understanding, hallowed be your name. There's sufficiency to his name. It carries some weight. Number two, lead with praise. Number three, pray for God's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's prayer is not the only place where Jesus role modeled a heart of obedience and, and, and submission to the will of God over his own desires and needs. Can I remind you of the garden of Gethsemane? Where hours before the crucifixion happened in Jesus' life, he tells his disciples, hey, can you, can you pray? Can you go and pray? Because I'm going to go talk to God. And he has a conversation with him. And th this is where I am extremely thankful for Scripture because I get to see the vulnerability of my Savior. Because if, if, if we're honest, sometimes it can feel platformed so much, like, oh, he's, he's so great, he has, he has so much going on that there's no way, there's no way I can empathize with him. I empathize with him saying, God, if there's any other way that this can happen, can, can we do that? Th this is going to hurt. Him basically saying, my flesh doesn't want to do this. That human part that you gave me, <laughs> It doesn't want to encounter this. Scripture doesn't say this, but I can, my mind is very imagine, imaginatory, imagine, imagination driven, imagine, whatever, figure it out for yourself. <laughs> Brain's a weird place. You can almost imagine there's this, you know, this, if this cup can, can pass from me, please, please let it pass from me. I can, I can almost imagine this deep breath. This, <sighs> Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Not my will, but yours. Well, church, when we begin to pray, have, I, I don't think I've ever seen this in Scripture before. The, the verse after that says, And then an angel sent from heaven to be with Jesus and strengthen him. After he prays, go look, go look it up. It's in, let me show you. I'll tell you so you can look it up later. Oh, well, you don't think I'm lying. Luke chapter 22. It says an angel was sent to him and strengthened him. As if to say, good job. You get it. When we begin to pray and submit to the will of God for our life, your kingdom come, your will be done. He empowers us and strengthens us to see it through. Why? Because I can't just do it on my own. I have that, that human disease called sometimes laziness, tiredness. Or something that doesn't logically make sense to me, my appendages just don't want to work. I don't, I don't get it. But to get to a place that where I put my flesh into submission, and that spirit man begins to, begins to cry out and say, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And to know through that submission, he sends the spirit of God to empower me, to strengthen me. You're not alone in your submission to God. Listen, in a world where right and wrong are frequently confused and the future is so uncertain, it can be hard to know how to pray or what to ask for in difficult situations and circumstances and when they arise. Just pray for God's will. Pray for God's will. And, and can I mess this up sometimes? Our will isn't always, or God's will isn't always our way. It's, it, it sounds super cliche, but Lord, has it been true? <laughs> so sometimes I would like to submit and say, God, you know, I think you missed this one. Because from the way I see it, he could have knocked out a couple of steps. But then, I be, then I'm reminded that he's more, more worried about what I learn on the way there than if I get there or not. 
who I can encounter on the way there. There was just instant sanctification. It takes me up. He misses the opportunity for his glory to be seen in somebody else's life through my obedience and faithfulness and submission. That's his will being done. Sometimes his will hurts. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's cloudy. But then we get little nuggets of, oh, okay, that's why. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Anyone else want to see the glory of God rest on earth as it is in heaven? Anybody else? Why? What's it like? Revelation 21. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the older things have now been passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. That's on earth as it is in heaven. Church, that's what we have to look forward to. God, I want your will, your way. Because I want people to encounter you and experience you here so they can experience that there. But it takes submission of what we want, the way we want it. Take submission. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number four. I need to hurry. Somebody tell me hurry. Okay, that was not needed. All right, number four. Asking according to his will. Ask according to his will. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today. Um, with with uh, a vulnerable heart, I, I'm in this stage. Anyone else a planner? Anyone else like to know how things are going to work out? Anyone crunch numbers and go, well, <laughs> some things need to change. Anyone else look at their life and like, well, the, you know, this, that, the other. So when, it, when he just says, give us today, I'm like, Jesus, that, you blew that one. You blew that one. He should have said, give us our monthly Walmart grocery pickup haul that we needed for this month. That would have been a little easier. I'm going to be honest with you. But now experiencing life, I'm understanding the value of why he said, give us today our daily bread. You know what that keeps me? Dependent. Ah, oh, man, it keeps me dependent. There's a lot of times we feel like we can manipulate our life the way that we want it to be. Let, 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 let us never forget all gifts come from him. Now, what you do with that gift, you'll answer for it. If your gift is bigger than somebody else's gift, there's a reason for that. And it's not just you're smarter or greater. Much is given, much is required. What are you doing with that gift? Some who go in that day-to-day, -day, give us today my daily bread, have so much greater dependence on the power and the majesty of God than someone who is able to say, for the next 50 years, I don't need to work. There's a lot of eyes in that statement. I can do. I can make it. I can survive. Rather than the posture of, God, give me what I need for today. Give me, give me just enough that I, I, I got it. And then, you know what? Make, I, I can give some to somebody else too. Give us today our daily bread. In Jesus' time, bread was a staple, one of the most basic needs of life. Saw another, like Matthew chapter 4. He says, man does not live on, um, on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think he's showing something as basic as bread that he'll provide. And he sees the need. And our God is faithful enough to provide. But we often hesitate, don't we, to bother God with the little things that we need. I don't want to bother him over this. I'll wait till something bigger happens. Then something bigger happens, and we try to do it ourselves. And we lose that. God, give us today our daily bread. God, help me look to you Help me not look to my own resources, my own understanding. 
but I want to trust and acknowledge that you have it under control. Give me today my daily bread. Ask according to his will. Give us today our daily bread. Number five, repent and forgive. And forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Church, our heart needs to stay bent towards repentance. And God can do a lot with true repentance. Not more than just an I'm sorry. I'm talking repentance. Biblically, to turn your back away from, to turn towards something else. That's repentance. Now, I'm all for apology. I'm all for the apology culture. People need to hear you say I'm sorry. There needs to be an accountability for your actions. But repentance is more so than just out of the mouth. It's through the heart. The place is different. It's not just from from mind to mouth. It's from heart to mouth. The place where that comes, repentance. God, I'm, I'm sorry. Cover me with your grace. That's not just a mind thing. That should be a heart thing. It's completely choosing something or someone else. Repentance should be postured from our knowledge of what Jesus did on the cross. Out of that knowledge of what Jesus did on the cross spurs our repentance. Why? I don't want to take what he did on the cross for granted. It means something to me. It's more than just shown as a symbol. It's a reminder of his goodness, a sacrifice that he didn't even deserve. Repentance. This one's a little easier, you know, right? If we understand the other power of Jesus in our life and we understand that, that, that's great. This next one sometimes can be a bit of a struggle. (laughs) Forgive, right? We're we're, we're kind of down with the repentance part. Yeah, God, I need you. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But then, mm -mm, whatever you want to do. Forgiveness. Out of our forgiveness received, forgive others. Those two things are married together. Out of that recognition of what Jesus did on the cross, the forgiveness and grace given to me should flow to other people forgiveness. You may have heard it before. If not, need I remind you, lack of forgiveness only hurts you. Doesn't hurt the other person. Oftentimes they forgot about it. And we're just mad, frustrated, stomping our feet, looking at their face and post, mm, I wish you'd get a flat tire. Mm. I hope she gets to the grocery line with two baskets and forgets her wallet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> that did not happen to me. That, that, that is not lived experience. I've never thought that before. when we keep in mind what, what, what Christ did for me it helps me have a little more grace for other people so I don't want unforgiveness in my heart why? because it never stops with just unforgiveness that plants a seed I start reaping bitterness I start reaping resentment I start harvesting hatred all from just unforgiveness in my life Repent and forgive. Lastly, number six, pray protection and deliverance. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. My mind, I was looking at this, I'm like, okay, Jesus, now you're just showing off, right? That's easy for you to say. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, says Jesus. How hard was that for you, right? My temptations are just greater than your temptations, Jesus. You just don't understand, right? He was fully God, but also fully man. He didn't just bounce off temptations with a divine force field. He experienced them. 
shows us that in Hebrews chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Again, thankful for the humanity of Jesus. It gives me hope. So for him to say, lead us not into temptation, now I can say, all right, God, if your your son prayed it, so can I. Can I, can I challenge us with leading us not to temptation is often leading us to him, right? If we're steering our ship towards God, oftentimes we start passing by temptation more and more. We recognize where he's going. It's more important than what is around me. Pastor talked about uh, Peter walking on water. It's one of, my, one of my favorite stories and just it's just cinematic in its experience. I'd love to see a movie on it. But one, one of the parts that, that stood out to me is, you know, Jesus calls out, uh, or Peter calls out to Jesus, hey, go, come, tell me to come to you, this, that, and the other, and he gets out. And, starts, and it, it never says the storm stopped. How do I know that? Why? What it says. When Peter noticed the winds and the waves, he began to sink. When Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he was able to see, oh, there's other things around me that could hurt or harm me. Began to sink. Lead us not into temptation. God, I want you to lead me where you want me to go. Help, help steer and guide and direct me. Help me say no to good things so I can say Yes, to great things, to your things in my life. Temptations aren't always the, the big, bad, ugly sins. Sometimes the, the temptation is just to get content in where you are, get comfortable. Oh, this is good, but is, is it great? Is it God? Lead us not to temptation. And the one one day we'll be able to sing true forever deliver us from the evil one God I know that in these moments we will face trials we will face temptations we will face difficulties we will face the consequences of life but God I'm looking at you as my deliverer a foreshadowing of what he's going to do when he comes for his church because he already told me in Revelation that there's going to be no more weeping no more mourning no more death no sickness or pain there shall we ever be with the Lord That's delivering me from the evil one. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Would you stand with me? This morning in um, in worship, I felt that there was heaviness in the room. There's heaviness in the room. Not in a bad way, not as if we were hindering worship. We're not hindering the move of God. But I feel like there, there might be more in this room that need to take the moment and release whatever you have to Him. And I, I want to be accountable enough to Him to give us that opportunity band's going to play something really really quick just to make an opportunity I feel like in this room if you were walking with heaviness this morning it's, it's on your mind it's now on your heart now it's out of your lips now others are, are, are dealing with it as well whatever the heaviness is this morning I challenge you 
give it to him in prayer. Offer it to him in praise. This might be your moment where it's just hallowed be your name. God, I don't have adequate words. I don't have adequate prayers. But I have something on my heart and my life that I need to give to you. I don't want us to leave this place with the same heaviness that he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Exchange it. Exchange it this morning. You were never meant to carry that heaviness. You were never meant to. I said this morning on the way here, I felt God so pronounced in my spirit, I want to rebuild people. That takes submission. He won't rebuild a life unless you're willing to submit it to him. That takes submission. Free will has consequence. Can we take the time to let God rebuild our life for just a few moments? We're going to open these altars. We're going we're gonna to sing. If you don't mind going back into um, Build My Life. Just a few moments. I just want to open up. I want to open up to this altar area. I'm going to pray that if that's something that's on your heart or your mind or your spirit this morning, you just want to give it to God, it's for you. Father, today, I preach my heart. God, your spirit has moved in this service. Your spirit has moved in worship. God, you visited us this morning. The same one who said, come to me. All you who are weary, all you who are tired, all you who are facing difficulty, the same one who says, here, take my yoke upon you. Give me what you're worried about. Give me what you're caring about. Give me what you're struggling with. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. God, let us not leave here today walking with that same heaviness, walking with that same weariness in our heart, our mind, or our spirit. Let it not weigh us down any longer. We release it to you, God. We were never meant to carry it. I don't want to keep carrying around the same things you already died for. Help us leave it at the cross. Help us leave it at the cross. Trespassed against us. God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil.
this time we're going to dismiss our online service. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for coming to Evangel this morning via online. We love you.